Hi there, this is Colin McGarry with X Troop Secret Commandos. In 1942, British military planners decided they needed another weapon that they didn't yet have German speaking commandos. The only group that fit the bill were German speaking Jewish refugees from Austria, Hungary, and Germany. One of these young men was Colin Anson. His father had been arrested after confronting an American Nazi sympathiser in a beer killer in Frankfurt. He died in Dachau. As things got worse, his mother managed to get him out with the Quakers, taking a group of children to Britain. Once in Britain, he was in a colony getting agricultural training. Peter Masters lived in Vienna. Shortly after the Anschluss, he was aggressed by a group of Hitler youths. Soon after, his mother saw an SS car outside. They had to go. A train took them to Munich in Germany, then another bound for France. Near the border, two German officers came in to check passports. A Frenchman let them pretend they were part of his extended family. As the two officers were walking away, one said to the other that he thought the Frenchman was just pretending. The other just shrugged his shoulders and in a few minutes they were in France. Manfred Gans lived in northwest Germany near the Dutch border. Before Hitler came to power, he would get anti-Semitic remarks, but no more. After Hitler's rise to power, stormtroopers had been in front of their family business, blocking the entrance. Manfred's brother, Gershon, went to Palestine. The rest of the family would follow later. Moritz, the father, started the process of getting visas to go to the US, but in 1938, realised that the situation was worsening rapidly. Manfred went with his father to Holland and then to England. September 1939, war broke out. 70,000 refugees suddenly became enemy aliens. One day, upon returning from work, Manfred found two policemen at the door. They were taking him into internment. He collected his engineering books and as many clothes as possible in a big suitcase. Then he was away to Wath Mills Camp near Manchester. It was a terrible place. They slept on floor on straw mattresses. There were rats running around during the night. The only sanitary provision was a bucket. After nearly two months of this, Manfred was transferred to Priest Heath Camp near Shrewsbury. Living in tents in Priest Heath was a great improvement, but after a month of rain, the tents became unlivable. Manfred was now transferred to the Isle of Man. With less people going on holiday, the Manx government saw the internment camps as a good source of revenue and jobs. Boarding houses by the sea were filled with internees. Next to Manfred's compound were German prisoners and German pro-Nazis. They would cheer when news of German victories were announced. Another refugee from Vienna was Paul Hornig. He'd received a visa for Britain and was studying at Cambridge. When he was arrested, he was sent to Canada on the HMS Ettrick. There were 1,300 refugees and 1,300 German prisoners. The German prisoners had the cabins and the refugees were in the hold. In Canada, he was sent to a camp near Montreal. Hans Gutmann escaped from Berlin to England after having been forced to tear down his own synagogue. On arriving in England, he learned that his father had a heart attack when his factory was raided and that his mother had been taken to a concentration camp. When he was loaded into the HMS Dunra to sail to Australia, a fellow internee on the boat later wrote in his memoirs that their treatment by the British sailors shows that you can become a vicious brute with no special training. After arriving in Sydney, the report on the conditions of the internees was leaked to the press. This resulted in Major Scott, who was responsible for them, being court-martialed. When Julian London was sent to see which internees could be sent back to England, the men were told that if they volunteered for the Pioneer Corps, they could get back to England. The Pioneer Corps carried out non-combat roles like building and cleaning up. This was seen as a safe place for enemy aliens. Most volunteered 
and they were sent back to Liverpool. Being in the Pioneer Corps for these men was better than being interned but frustrating. They wanted a chance to strike back at Hitler. Some of the men had been transferred from combat units to the Corps when it was discovered they were enemy aliens. Since number 10 commander would be made up of foreign nationals, their missions would depend on their native language. This idea pleased Churchill. He said to look into it to see if the idea was viable. July 2nd, 1942 was the official birth date of number 10 commando. It is made up of the following troops. French was troop number one, the Dutch number two, Belgians number four, Norwegians number five, the Polish number six, Yugoslavia number seven, and the British troop, X troop, made up of German-speaking refugees. They were the secret shock troop. They would kill and capture Nazis in the battlefield and interrogate them on the spot. Because they were nearly all Jewish, they would need special protection. Captain Brian Hilton Jones was chosen to lead this troop, but he had no members yet. He wanted only the most intelligent men to be chosen. That's how Manfred Gans, Peter Masters and Colin Anson became part of X Troop. A new private joined the group of internees in the Isle of Man, asking questions of the others about their origins and plans. He took Peter aside one day and proposed joining the X Troop. The private was actually an intelligence officer. Throughout the autumn of 41 and the following spring, that scene was repeated many times. In August 42, the men were given a rail ticket for London and told to report to the Grand Great Central Hotel in Maribyrn. There they were told to stay in hotel until they saw their name on the notice board with directions. The process lasted over a week, but one by one their names appeared on the notice board and they went as instructed to the interview. The interviewers were Hilton Jones and Hungarian Sergeant George Lane the first member of X Troop. About a third of the interviewees were accepted to go on to combat and explosives training. After being told by Hilton Jones that they were going to become commandos, he asked one of them their name. The man answered with his name, but Hilton Jones said, no, it isn't. You must all leave this room with a new name and it must not be Montgomery. This was a great shock for the men. Their name was the only tie with their family. But this was the first step in the transition from stateless Jewish refugees to British commandos. Gotthard Baumwaldsfinner became Gerald Barnes. Konstantin Goldberg became Kenneth Gavin. Many tried to keep their first name. Colin Anson had been called Klaus Asher. When he went to see Hilton Jones, he still had no idea of a name. But then he heard two Avro Ansons fly over. I'm Colin Anson, he said. When the first recruit who had helped with the interviews had to change his name from Lanyi Yogi, he thought of George Smith. Coming from his mouth, it sounded like Schmidt. Hilton Jones said, don't be a fool, you can't even pronounce it. They decided on George Lane. The first interviews of this group had taken place on the 20th of August 1942, the day after Operation Jubilee, the raid on Dieppe. The first edition of X Troop had taken part in Jubilee. Their mission, devised by Emin Fleming, was to get a Kriegsmarine Enigma machine out of Dieppe. Like the raid in general, their mission failed and the majority of the troop were casualties. Hilton Jones vowed that that wouldn't happen again the X troop would be the most intelligent and the best trained troops. They were taken to Abedovi in Wales, the HQ of number 10 commando. On their arrival, they were regrouped together and one by one advanced towards Hilton Jones to receive the commando green berry. They also exchanged their hobnail boots for rubber sole boots. Commandos had to move quietly. There were no organised billets for them. Hilton Jones sent them into the village to knock on doors and ask to be lodged. Nobody refused. Tony Firth had thought 
that rather than the knock on the modest house doors, he'd find the biggest house in the village. He and Colin Anson were taken in. In the morning, Hilton Jones told them that before breakfast, they would take an eight-mile run up and down the surrounding hills. Manfred Gans was a long-distance runner, so look forward to it. Colin Anson wondered if he would make the first mile. Everybody made it, but some threw up their breakfast. The next day they did an 11 mile run. Soon they were doing 40 mile runs. Hilton Joes never asked him to do anything he couldn't do. He was usually with him in the front. Only Manfred Gans could outrun him. On one run some men collapsed and the others carried on to the finish. Hilton Jones was livid. He admonished them, you don't leave anybody behind. If someone faints you carry him. A large part of their training was carried out on Snowdon the ice mountain in Wales. They soon knew it like an old friend. They had to be capable of taking part and reassembling many different weapons, including German guns. After less than a month at Abadovi, they were sent to Achnacarry in Scotland. The training there was run by Lieutenant Colonel Vaughan. He didn't like ruddy foreigners and gave them a hard time here they learned how to be invisible in the field and operating at night. Hilton Jones told them to sleep during the day for a month with exercises during the night. At the end of their stay, they had a night exercise crossing the lock, then the countryside and the scene. Colin Anson's uniform was frozen solid, it was so cold. Lieutenant Colonel Vaughan, who never believed these ruddy foreigners could make the grade, admitted to Hilton Jones that those bastard foreigners were quite fit. In May 43, four men were chosen to take part in Operation Husky. That would be the landings in Sicily coming from North Africa. Paul Streeton went in on the first wave with the 41 RMC just after midnight on July the 10th. As soon as they landed, they realised they were in the wrong place. The senior officer led the attack but was cut down by machine gun. After waiting for the fire to stop, they carried on the attack, shouting loudly. The Italian troops soon surrendered. Twenty minutes later, Colin Anson was heading in with the 40 Royal Marine Commando. They were amazed to find that the Italian pillboxes were camouflaged with hay. A few phosphorus grenades set this blazing. The Italians soon surrendered. Inland they were held up by snipers in an olive grove. Mortars were fired to dislodge them. The men of the British ex-troop had been chosen for their fluency in German. Here Colin was interrogating Italian prisoners. He did the best he could. During the next few days he worked up the east coast of Sicily. Their commanding officer was wounded and Colin Anson found himself leading the troop. He seized a ladder from a farm and organised a party to take the lieutenant to the A station. Wanting to keep in good terms with the locals, he returned the ladder and apologised, but he couldn't find the word for ladder, so he made walking action with his fingers. Locals said, La Scala! A la Scala! Collins said, and then he sung a scale. The British commandos thought he was fluent in Italian now. Now the Germans were defending a vital bridge near the coast. A plan was hatched to outflank them. Colin Anson, with some of the 40 RMC, were on the HMS Queen Emma. It would outflank the Germans, and then they were going ashore in a sort craft carried on the ship. During the night, they were attacked by a bomber. Though Colin had been sleeping in a hammock on the deck to keep cool, he was knocked off the hammock by a blast from a bomb. He went down below decks to see if he could help and he took some of the wounded men to the A station. After he'd taken the last one he could find, he said to the medic, if you've got any bandages left, I think I've scratched my forehead. And the medic looked at him. He said, sit down. He had a big piece of shrapnel in his forehead. He'd made a hole in it. In the operating theatre, they could see his brain he was taken to Alexandria and then he ended up in Cairo in hospital. In March 1944, 
Colin Anson was back in Italy. He was to join 40 and 43 Commando on a mission to help Joseph Tito, who led the Yugoslavian partisans against the Germans. The partisans had taken back the island of Vis from the Italians. It was crowded with partisans and British troops. From there, Anson took part in raids against the Germans. Tito and his group were held up in Vra. The Germans mounted an operation to eliminate him and his followers. In response to this, the British organised Operation Flounced. The aim was to launch an attack on Brac, with members of 40 and 43 Gamado, and Yugoslav partisans. It was hoped that the Germans would think there was a full-scale invasion and divert troops from Dvra to Brac, allowing Tito to escape. The mission started at midnight on the 2nd of June, 44. Lieutenant Colonel Mad Jack Churchill led the operation. He had a meeting with his officers and Sergeant Anson. Anson's unit was to lead the attack against the German strong point on the high land in the middle of the island. The others would carry out flanking attacks. They were running up the hill. The only sound was their breathing and stones moving under their feet. Suddenly two Messerschmitts flew out towards the beach, no doubt wanting to destroy their landing craft. Then two hurricanes dropped down on their tails. An impressive dogfight followed, ending with the Messerschmitts retreating. The sound of the dogfight and the commandos cheering meant that there was no surprise. Mortars and machine guns opened up. Many commandos were falling. They wouldn't be able to capture the strong point, but that didn't matter. They were just there as a diversion. They were told to hold on till ordered to pull out. Jack Churchill started playing the bagpipes to rally the men. The Germans tried to take him out, but no one managed to. They were ordered to attack the strong point again. Jack Churchill set out with his bagpipes, broadsword and longbow towards the Germans. The fighting continued for a day and night before they were told to pull back to the beach. The operation was a success in that the Germans had diverted 3,000 troops from Thra. September 43, X troops were transferred to Littlehampton. Here they trained for parachute jumps. They were taken up to Ringway near Manchester for jumping from a platform, then a balloon, then eight flights. Several men were injured during these jumps. The first jump from the platform was carried out by Hilton Jones. He plummeted to the ground, but wasn't hurt, and did a second successful jump straight away. There were a few sprained ankles, and Victor Davis was in a plaster cast for months. The last exercise had been dropped in Scotland, with nothing to eat. After a week in Scotland, they were given 24 hours to get back to Little Hampton. Bill Watson did this by stealing a motorcycle, when it ran out of gas, he sneaked into a train and then he stole a jeep for the last leg of the journey. One ex-trooper was arrested for wearing British uniform and having a German accent. Hilton Jones had to go and get him out. Members of ex-troop participated in reconnaissance raid on the French coast. They were to gain intelligence and to capture prisoners to interrogate. In April, a film taken from a bomber showed a strange phenomena. A bomb falling in the sea near Hullgate, short of its target, set off a train reaction. Was this some new deadly weapon? Operation Tarbrush was launched to get a sample of whatever it was. George Lane went in from a motor torpedo boat and brought back the information that it wasn't a new superweapon, but telemines on the beams in the sea. The mines had rusted and the bomb had set off a chain reaction. This was good news for the planners, but they weren't completely satisfied. Two more missions were carried out to be sure. On the last mission, Lane and Captain Woodridge went into the beach at Alt. It was three weeks before D-Day. Hilton Jones was in the motorboat. Lane and Woodridge were overdue for their planned rendezvous. They went in close to the shore but found nothing. That to leave or jeopardise the whole operation. Lane and Woodridge weren't there because they'd been taken prisoner already. Crouching in the surf to check the hedgehogs, machine guns started firing. Had they been seen, or was it the crouts letting off steam? Everything was quiet again. They'd been making their way back to the motorboat when a German e-boat approached. 
They thought of trying to pretend they were fishermen, soon realised it was futile. They threw their weapons in the sea and raised their hands. They were locked in separate cells. During the initial interrogation, they kept hearing the words Gestapo and SS, which was worrying. Lane wasn't worried about giving away D-Day secrets, as he didn't know anything. But he was worried about giving away details of the ex-troop. They were then driven inland for some time. They didn't know where they were, but it was the Chateau de la Roche-Guillon, on the River Seine, not far from Paris. The two officers were separated, and the soldier guarding him said he should tidy himself up as he was about to meet somebody important. He was led into an office. There was somebody by the fireplace with his back to him. The person turned round, and Lane recognised Rommel. Rommel said, you realise you're in a tricky situation. Lane replied that it wasn't tricky, it was a POW. But my people think you're a saboteur. If you thought I was a saboteur, you wouldn't have invited me for tea. How's my friend Montgomery? Rommel asked. I don't know him personally, but you'll meet him very soon. Rommel then asked where the invasion might be. Lane said, I'm just a lonely officer, not privy to such information. After some time, Lane was relieved to be taken in charge by the Wehrmacht, not the SS or the Gestapo. He was taken to the POW camp. His cover story of being Welsh didn't stand up for more than five minutes amongst the British POWs. They thought he was a stooge. He went to see the senior British camp officer. He explained he was a member of X Troop. What the hell is that? I'll explain, said Lane. Once he checked out his story, he gave some useful information about Rommel's HQ. With a clandestine transmitter, this info was sent to London. Lane now wrote a letter to his wife, Miriam Rothschild, to inform her that he was alive. She already knew as a message by the Germans had been intercepted about two British officers captured on the beach. On the 4th of June, the commandos were grouped near Southampton. Lord Lovett came to give them a pet speech and told them that the invasion had been postponed 24 hours due to bad weather. On the evening of the 5th, they were taken to Warsash. Ex-troop had never fought as a distinct unit they were in demand from other units due to their German fluency and general excellence. For D-Day, Masters was seconded to the Bicycle Troop, officially number one troop of six commando. They were to ride ahead towards Beneville Bridge, where the commandos were to relieve the airborne. They would be the first to come up against German entrenched in land. Manfred Gans, Maurice Latimer, and Peter Moody were to go with the 41 RMC. Their mission was to land on the western flank of Sword Beach and join up with the 48 Royal Marine Commando coming from Juno Beach. As the commando ship convoy sailed past the Isle of Wight with Lord Lovett's ship in the lead, Bill Millen played the road to the Isles on his bagpipes. The LCI carrying Peter Masters beached and he was going down the slippery ramp holding his bike in one hand and a tommy gun and the rope in the other. The beach wasn't as it should have been. The 8th Brigade should have cleared the beach before the commandos arrived. Lord Lovett was in the following landing craft. He was wading ashore. The man just behind him was cut down. Bill Millian was following, playing the bagpipes. Harry Nomberg was coming in with three troop of number 6 commando. As he moved off the beach, the first two Germans he met surrendered to him. He interrogated them on the spot. They told him where the gun emplacements were and the minefields. Manfred Gans, at the other end of the beach, ran through a gap in the barricade blown by the sappers. There was a platoon of about 20 Germans who all put their hands up. He said, Good morning, gentlemen. Where is the path through the minefields? They were so shocked to be addressed politely in perfect German, they pointed to the pass. He led the group of commandos with him through the minefield to the rendezvous point near Lyon-sur-Mer. They didn't know then, but half the commandos of 41 Royal Marine Commando were casualties. 
Manfred was waiting for backup at the assembly point. He saw one commando approaching. It was Maurice Latimer. Latimer suggested they wait no longer and continue to Lyon sur Mer. 45 Royal Marine Commando were the last to land. They were to cross Benneville Bridge and then carry on to Merville Battery to make sure it was out of action. George Saunders was with them. They landed in the wrong place and seemed to be drowning in their own blood. Once out of the water, George ran to get behind the dunes. After witnessing Bill Millen playing the bagpipes on the beach, Masters headed inland with a cycle troop. They were soon held up by a sniper and all died for cover. Masters heard the distinctive sound of a Sherman tank approaching. The commander had his head out of the tank. Masters shouted to him to be aware of the sniper. The tanker closed the hatch, then shot up the hedge with his cannon and machine guns. The commander's had no trouble getting across the field now. Imagine the emotion of the locals seeing the British troops coming in after four years of occupation. They carried on to the rendezvous point to find that the commanders without bicycles had arrived first. Lord Lovett was there. Masters went over to some prisoners to interrogate them. Lovett called out, ask them where the howitzers are. The prisoners didn't reply. He realised they must be Russian, not Poles. He tried French and Lord Lovett joined in, but still no reply. Lovett instructed the bicycle troop to carry on to Benneville. It was hard going on those bikes. Their Tommy gun was trapped across their backs and their pack was on the holder in the handlebars. The weight pulled down the holder onto the front wheel and it would block now and again, especially when they were trying to accelerate past snipers. On a hill before Benneville, the lead man was hit by machine gun fire. They all died for cover. Captain Robinson said to Masters, go down to the village to see what was going on. How many men shall I take? No men, just you. Peter remembered that Miriam Rothschild had warned them of this. The British might use them as a suicide squad. So be it, he thought, if this is the only way. Walking down the main street, there was no firing. He remembered Cary Grant in Gunga Din. To quell an angry mob, he shouted, they're all under arrest. Peter called out in perfect German. All right, surrender, all of you. You're surrounded. You don't have a chance. A German stood up behind a wall, looked at him for a moment. Then he fired, but missed. Masters went down on one knee and fired his Tommy gun, and he missed. He fired again, but the Tommy gun jammed. He dived for cover to clear the weapon. He heard a noise behind him. The bicycle troop was charging with bayonets fixed. He joined them, and most of the Germans ran away. They now crossed Pegasus Bridge with bullets ringing on the framework. On the second bridge at Ranville, one man was shot by a sniper. Lord Lovett arrived about half an hour later. At the other end of the beach, Manfred Gans and his group of commandos had reached Lyon sur Mer. They moved along the edge of the street, going from house to house. Manfred went into a house as a bullet from the next house just missed him. He wore black tennis shoes instead of boots. He stealthily went up the stairs of the next house to find a civilian firing at the Germans. It was an Algerian using a rifle from 1870 Franco-Prussian War. Manfred persuaded him to join them. Colonel Tim Gray caught up with them, with the survivors of 41 Royal Marine Commando. Gans told him about the German gun further up the street. Three Avrays turned up to take on the strong point, but the three of them were knocked out. In the light of this setback, Gray decided to wait for reinforcements the next day. George Saunders was heading towards Merville 
with 45 Royal Marine Commando. Near Salonel, they came under artillery fire and Saunders was separated from the others. He sheltered in his cellar and helped himself to the wine and cheese stored there. When the artillery stopped, he moved out and found a bicycle. Approaching a crossroad, he saw a group he took for his comrades. He waved to them. One of them called Dashestein Anglander and fired at him. He dived into a ditch. The Germans were searching for him. If they got close, he would throw a grenade and move or fire and move. He realised he couldn't avoid them forever in this way. He found a pond and went into it, pulling a camouflage net over himself. They finally gave up and moved away. Now we get back to the British lines. The cycle troops now carried on to help 45 Royal Marine Commando at Franceville Plage near Merville Battery. The Germans had gone back to the battery. Masters were sent ahead to reconnoitre. They were surprised to find a cafe open and the locals in there were only too happy to share what they knew about the German defences. The Germans had been working all night to reinforce Merville. Suddenly a jeep screeched to a halt outside. George Saunders walked in. He was the ex-trooper who'd hidden in the pond. They were happy to find each other alive after 24 hours. Saunders left Masters at the bar. Then he was with the 45 Royal Marine Commando attacking Franceville. As they weren't able to take Franceville, they were instructed to hold the high land overlooking Franceville between Franceville and Amphreville overlooking the estuary and Sword Beach. Manfred Gans with the 41 RMC in between Sword and Juno was now tasked with attacking the Douve radar station. On D-Day the Canadian troops had tried to get in but failed. Now the commandos took over. It was the strongest strong point in the region. There were strong bunkers inside the whole site was surrounded by 20 foot high fences on each side of a 300 yard minefield. It was defended by anti-tank guns, mortars and machine guns. The whole site in two parts was called Distilfink which means goldfinch. There were bunkers in Distilfink 1 called Moltk and one Hinberg. On the 11th Gans and two marines were heading to Moltk. They cut through the first fence then Gans led them through the minefield. If you run, you have a good chance of sitting off a mine. If you crawled, you'd be there so long you risk being seen. Gans went through, crouching and feeling the ground in front of him. If there was a mine, the ground would be softer due to being overturned. At the second barbed wire fence, he checked that it wasn't electrified before cutting it. They visited the gun positions and found them to be unoccupied and then saw that the bunker had heavy steel doors. Gans led them back out again, making sure to connect the cut wire. At the Saulnier farm in Amphreville, where Lovett had his headquarters, they were being fired on by a German half-track with a Nebelwerfer on it. It would fire, then retreat. Shelley and Stewart volunteered to seek it out and destroy it. Every time it fired, they were closing a bit. When they were close enough to throw a grenade in, then they immediately followed and fired on the crew. They now drove it back to Amphreville, where it stayed for a few weeks. Shelley and Stewart received the battle commission for this action. Dover radar station was finally taken on the 17th of June by concerted attack by tanks and commandos. Sherman crab tanks led the way through, followed by the commandos. Manfred Gann saw a periscope sticking out of a bunker. He smashed the glass and jammed a phosphorus shell in the tube. From a distance he fired at it to set it off. This sent white hot phosphorus down the tube into the bunker. The Germans started spilling out with a white flag. 150 came out. After the mitigated success of D-Day, there were several weeks of stalemate. After San Lo being taken and Khan on the 18th and 19th July, the situation started to change. Operation Cobra on the 25th of July made a breakthrough of the German defences and this became a breakout. During the stalemate, ex-troopers had taken part in many patrols. Now they were participated in the push eastwards from the Bavent Ridge. By September, Antwerp had been taken. 
Montgomery overlooked the fact that the approach tunnel was vital and didn't secure it, but set off Operation Market Garden. The idea of that was to send three airborne divisions to capture three bridges. If successful, that would open the way into Germany. But it failed. Arnhem was the bridge too far. Ships couldn't get to Antwerp without negotiating the estuary of the Scheldt. The Germans had had time to build up the strong defences on the island of Valkyrin. The Canadians launched an attack which ended in a massacre. Now Manfred Gans was to go in with the 41 Royal Marine Commando. The north of the island had high dunes along it, meaning that vehicles couldn't land there. The rest of the coast was made up of dikes which kept the sea off the land, which was below sea level. Bombers had destroyed the dike near West Capel, flooding the town and the land. That made it even easier for the Germans to defend their strong points. Gans and Maurice Latimer were going in with the 41 Royal Marine Commando. Thoughts of Dieppe were on Gans' mind. They were going into well-defended town. A fortuitous naval barrage cleared the beach as they arrived and he advanced past the machine guns' positions into the town. Their first objective was the lighthouse at the end of the street. Only two of the 28 promised tanks had arrived. Nobody knew what to do. Manfred decided immediate action was called for. He walked down the main street towards the lighthouse and called out, Come out and surrender before the tanks go into action. A German officer came out and asked who he was. Manfred said he was a British commander with half the British army behind him. The officer wanted to surrender, but he was making a list of a lot of conditions. Gans saw that Latimer was approaching the lighthouse from the side. A few minutes later, he came out with a load of German prisoners. With the dike having been destroyed, the high tide flooded the town. They pulled out to some high land to wait for the tide to go down before facing the next task, which was the gun batteries between Westkapel and Domburg. They'd already sunk three support ships and an LCT. The first strong point had to be taken by a frontal assault. That went surprisingly well. Gans grabbed the captured sailor and forced him to show them the path through the mines to the next strong point. The wind was blowing the sand in their hair, their eyes, their mouth and their guns. With the second battery taken, the next objective was the heavily fortified battery at Domburg. Manfred was leading the commandos through the minefield using his crouching feeling technique. Suddenly four hurricanes dropped out of the sky, dropping 500-pound bombs. They all froze. This is it, they thought. No bombs fell near them. The pilots had seen the green berries and made sure to miss them. The bombing had distracted the Germans, giving the commandos time to get into the battery. Gann saw a German soldier taking cover. He shouted, you, surrender. The German ignored him and ran into the bunker. Grenades rained down on them. When the grenade stopped, Manfred ran into the bunker and came out a few minutes later with three prisoners. There were more bunkers and the fighting continued till morning. Hitler launched his last ditch effort of the Battle of the Bulge. Manfred was busy during that time interrogating prisoners captured during the fighting. Manfred had been corresponding with Joan Jerry from New York who had started writing to him. He now got a handwritten letter from her instead of the usual type letter. She admitted that her real name was Anita Lamb, his childhood sweetheart. He had more good news about his parents. They were alive but still in concentration camp at Thiensidstand. By the end of April, news of Hitler's death was broadcast. There was also rumours that the SS were trying to assassinate as many Jews as possible. Manfred went to his CO, Major Wood, he convinced him to give him a jeep, a driver and some jerry cans of fuel to go the 400 miles to Terensinstadt in Czechoslovakia, where his parents were held. On the way they drove through his hometown, he saw a British and American flag on his house. When finally he got to Terensinstadt, the women holding the records found where they were. They had to drive some distance, then she went in to find them and prepare them to meet their son. They spent the evening and the night telling of their experiences in the camp and all the horrors they'd seen. 
Manfred couldn't take them out. They were too weak to travel and there was typhus in the camp. Manfred and his driver, Bob, made the return journey and Manfred managed to see Princess Juliana of Holland. His parents were arrested in Holland, so they were in the Dutch part of the camp. Not long afterwards, Princess Juliana arranged for Manfred's parents to be flown back to Holland and they were living in an apartment in Eindhoven. This incredible saga was taken from the book by Lee Garrett with the title X Troop, The Secret Jewish Commandos of World War II. In the book's 350 pages, there are many more stories and details. Well, thanks for watching. Don't forget to give a thumbs up, comment, or you can even subscribe. Or help the channel with PayPal.